working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in a mist. I worship you. I worship you. Our common sense nation. Good to see everybody. Before we get started, I gotta give an apologize to Christy Meadows. We got we want to wish her a happy birthday. Uh, we didn't we didn't tell her that we was had switched up on <laughs> on Wednesday and that we had did the show on YouTube instead of doing it on Spreaker. Happy birthday to Christy Meadows. I'm sorry we missed it. Didn't get a chance to wish her a happy birthday. I told her next time we go live on YouTube. We're going to wish her another happy birthday, which will be either be tomorrow or Tuesday, one of the two. Good to see everybody. Brother um, GLC has put out links. Good to see you, my brother. Lisa Bates, uh, good to see you. Uh, Anthony, good to see you, my brother. Uh, Howard, God bless you, my brother Howard. Good to see everybody. It's good to be here. I'm sorry that uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't, we forgot to tell the whole crew. Well, let's blame it on GLC because I asked GLC. <laughs> I've been blaming it on GLC. I said, I asked GLC, which one do you think we should do it live on? Well, he said, at least you can make a little extra money if you do it on YouTube. And so we did it on YouTube as opposed to doing it on uh, on Spreaker. Uh, it was a pretty good show, though. It was a pretty good show. We may we may even go this Wednesday on, on, on YouTube, too. I think we had a lot of fun. But uh, anyway, uh, today we're going to be talking about the gospel. And as you see the title right there, it's not a very popular subject to most people. <laughs> now, we're going to be in a familiar passage to most of you guys. Luke chapter 16. Luke gospel chapter 16. And we're going to be starting at verse 19. It reads, there, were, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously every day. He had it going on. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, 
that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one raised from the dead. And we're going to talk about hell is real. Hell is a real place of everlasting pain and torment. Oh, yeah, it is. Hell is a place that is real. There is torment in hell. Don't let nobody fool you because there has been some groups who have attempted to soften the punishment of hell. Matter of fact, they've done away with hell altogether because it's highly offensive. In these progressive times, especially, we want to do away with hell because the God they say they serve would not possibly put anybody in the hell. So therefore, since they have made up in their mind uh, the image of God that they see, uh, they have come to the conclusion that we got to do away with hell. But if we got to do away with hell, we got to do away with heaven too. Because the same contents that talks about hell also talks about heaven. So if there is no hell, there is no heaven. And if there is no heaven, let's stop playing. Let's just act like the rest of the world. Let's do like all of the criminals do then. Since there is no hell, there is no heaven. So that's the conclusion we must come to. And they tried everything they can. Some have even suggested that a loving God would never ever, not the God they know. (laughs) Problem is the God they know doesn't exist. But God, I know, would never send somebody to hell. Well, technically, he's not sending you now. You're sending yourself to hell by rejecting his son. The God who I I know, the God who I've been serving all my life, would never put anybody in everlasting punishment and pain. That's not the God I know. God, you know, don't exist. He's a fixation of your mind. We're talking about the God of Scripture. See, the God of Scripture, you cannot just make it up. It's, This is not build a bear kind of God. You can't make it up as you go, I'll take this part of the God, but I don't like that part. I'll take this part, but I don't like that part. That ain't how it works. See, that's why he gave us the scripture so we can be without excuse. Now, to that I must say that we can only declare what the word of God has declared because we cannot technically comprehend eternity, nor can we fully comprehend hell. We must understand that hell was not prepared for humans in the first place. It was prepared for the devil and his demons. That's what the scripture says. Now, if you choose to follow the demons who follow Satan, you're going to get the same punishment that they followed. They wanted to be like the Most High. At least Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High. And I guess the rest of the angels, now demons, said, that sounds like a good idea. He created us. He made us. But we want to take over now. That's technically what they're saying. See, the Lord Jesus Christ says over in Matthew 25 and 41, Then shall he say unto also unto them, On the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, unto everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Who was it prepared for, Lord Jesus? It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, some choose the wrong road. Remember, it talks about that narrow gate and the wide gate. See, the wide gate is you following the devil. The narrow gate is you following the Lord Jesus Christ because straight and narrow, he's the door uh, to eternal life. And if you don't go through him, you ain't going around him. The Bible is the only book that really talks in detail about suffering. It's the only book really talks about everlasting life. The other ones is like a dos a dice a toss up it's like flip a coin if you do enough of this over here you can get to heaven no other spiritual book or so-called religious talks about heaven and hell and eternal life and salvation in sun in such certain terms as the word of god does and some people say that's narrow minded well you give me narrow minded anytime i want to be sure of this thing 
I don't want to waste my whole life. I don't want to waste my time saying I serve a God and he can't really make any sure promises to me. Well, we might as well just serve anything. Then I might as well get a light pole and say, that's my God. If I can't get no certainty, there will be many people in hell because they have rejected the grace of the Lord. As a matter of fact, it can be argued that there's going to be more people in hell than it is in heaven. Matter of fact, I ain't going to even argue. It's a fact. There are more people going to be in hell than it is going to be in heaven. Now, I must admit that we cannot really understand how awful hell is. Like some people just will carefully say, oh, you go to hell. But we don't really understand the concept of hell. We are what they call corporeal beings, and we cannot, we cannot, we can only uh, uh, comprehend what is the physical, the here and now. We can't understand eternity, even though we are, we understand that the language that it describes says it's everlasting. When it talks about God, it says from everlasting to everlasting. Now I know what everlasting means, but I can't fully comprehend that because I don't think we can really comprehend what everlasting means. So therefore, I don't think we can really comprehend what hell means. The, your mindset cannot wrap around what hell really entails. No matter how we attempt to imagine hell, it is a million times worse than anything we can contemplate in our minds. Did you hear what I say? I said no matter how worse, how bad you think hell is, it's a million times worse than anything you can contemplate in your mind. Whatever the worst suffering you ever came up with, that's child's play. The worst suffering. If, you, if I set you on fire, and when you're on fire, I dump more gasoline on and shoot you and stab you, it's still nothing compared to hell. That's child's play still. Because at least, eventually, I'm going to either die from being burnt up and the pain will stop right then, right? At least the earthly pain. But this hell thing is something... That never ceases. Can you even imagine that? At least if you said you got a thousand year sentence. I mean, that's bad when people say you got a life sentence. But at least in a thousand years, you can say, at least I'm going to get out in a thousand years. When it says eternal damnation, you don't get out in a thousand years. You don't get out in a million years. You don't get out in a trillion years. You never get out. Can you really comprehend something like that? So if you have a loved one, if you know somebody who don't know Jesus, they are on their way to everlasting torment. Now, if you say you really love these people, if people say they love people, why would you not try to warn them to avoid this place we call hell? See, I, I, the, the language that we use, Scripture talks about hell, but we don't really comprehend what it really means because our minds are limited. We cannot grasp the eternal punishment. Because we cannot truly understand eternity. Revelations 20 and 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Does your Bible read that? You might want to check that out in uh, Revelations 20 and 10. Does, your script, does the scripture in your Bible say that they will be tormented day and night and it's going to go on forever and ever? How long is ever? Is ever. <laughs> it says that those who proclaim a false gospel along with the beast will be tormented day and night forever. Just let that sink in for a minute. Because the more I think about this, the more I get scared just even comprehending something like that. I mean, we can all take a little pain, but can you take pain forever? Huh. Who can take pain forever? That's just a scary thought when you think about it. Hell is forever. How long is forever? Well, forever is forever. You can't even describe it because you got to use the term forever or everlasting to describe how long you'll be in hell. That means you're never being paroled. You will never get out. Shouldn't that want to make you uh, tell your loved ones about knowing Jesus, knowing that without him, the righteousness, without the righteousness of Jesus, you're not good enough. Your daddy not good enough. Your mammy, your granddaddy, none of them are good enough. 
There ain't but one person who's ever been good enough to go to heaven. And the only reason we're going is by placing faith in him and making him Lord of our lives. I'm not talking about this easy repentance stuff right here where you can still do anything you want to do. That ain't what the true gospel is. The true gospel makes you make a change. No, no, the, the true gospel makes you make a change. Because if you've been born again, what use does it say you've been born again? When a new baby come out, the baby don't have wrinkled skin when it comes out right because it's new. If you've been born again, why would you want to go back to the slop that you used to do? See, this, uh, see your works is not going to get you saved, but because you are truly saved, it should show in what you do in your actions. If a man say he has faith, James says, show me his works. In other words, James wasn't saying the works save you. He was saying if you truly are a Christian, it should manifest some fruit. It should manifest some way of life. You shouldn't act like the heathen. If you're acting just like the, that's like if I see a cow out here in the pasture and he's mooing and mooing, and all of a sudden somebody wants to say, that's a dog. Well, I don't care what you say. That's a cow. That's not a dog. Our thing is that we want to call people Christians, and this is a Christian. That's a fine Christian person. Well, every time I see this person, every time I hear this person, they're siding with filth and evil. And you says that's the characteristic. So you're saying that that person right there represents Jesus and they think they can do and, and say and live any kind of way. That's some cheap religion. I don't want any part of that cheap religion. That it can't help me in this life. I got to die to get what uh, this eternal uh, uh, salvation and peace is. I got to die first. No, we should have peace on this side. But what, what good is it? I'm only going to get peace on the other side. See, there's a change that comes about when you'd accept the Lord Jesus. It's preparing you for heaven. The sanctification process is preparing you for heaven. So you're going to live any kind of way and all of a sudden you'll get to heaven. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act right when I get to heaven. No, you're not because you're not going to heaven. What I'm saying is that uh, there is a consequences behind choices we make on this side. There's consequences. And the scripture says that uh, the, the, the demons and the false prophets, in other words, those who teach a false gospel, they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire, and they're going to be tormented. That's what the scripture says, day and night, nonstop. And how long is they going to be tormented day and night? Forever. How long is forever? Forever is forever. This tells me that suffering will never end for all those who have rejected the Lord Jesus and his atoning sacrifice. Just let that sink in. Sometimes we say things and we don't really think about it. I say, as anybody who you know, because it breaks my heart if I think it's about, I think about one of my loved ones who's passed away and I know they didn't know Jesus. I, I don't want to hear they're in a better place because they're not in a better place. I would be calling God a liar to say they're in a better place when they say, I don't know Jesus, I don't accept Jesus, but they dead all of a sudden they're in a better place. They're not in a better place. No, no, no. They don't need it. Well, let, let, let's stop this pretense. Let's, let's try to snatch people out of hell and lying to people does not snatch them out of hell. No, no, God hates sin. He does hate sin. That's why he sent Jesus. If he's not that upset about sin, why even send Jesus to let him be tormented like that? That's cruel if you ask me. You send Jesus down here to let people spit on him, beat him to death, crucify him, just, I mean, do all the most vile things to someone who had committed no sin, and you say God is not serious about sin? Are you serious? Why would he let his son be tortured like this if he's not serious about sin? I don't know if I want to serve a God who will be that cruel. That's cruelty right there. So you sent Jesus down here to do all this suffering, and there's another way. That's cruel. Not only is it cruel, you're calling God a liar. All those who attempt to sugarcoat God's word will be punished forever. Ain't no need you sugar. I don't care about you. All this, all this, this, this nicety, get along to go along stuff. People get so offended with facts. I've never seen so many people get offended with facts. The only they get offended with truth. You don't have a problem with me. I'm not smart enough to make this gospel up. If it's left up to me, I grade on the curve. Because I think it's, 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 but I can't, I don't have no hell, heaven and hell for you. It ain't what I say. It ain't what no other preacher say. It ain't no what the, the bishop say. It ain't what the, the pope says. It's what, what does God's word say about hell? Hell is not a place you want to, you want to end up. 
Mm -mm, mm -mm. You, you, you don't want to end up in hell. This is not a place that was technically even prepared for people. People have made jokes saying, all my friends will be there. Well, the Bible never speaks on anyone having company in hell. You won't find that nowhere, even in our texts. See, that may be part of the torment for all who go to hell. You will have no companionship forever. Just think about that. Remember when they said when babies come out, if you don't ever, if nobody ever touches the baby, the baby you just die from loneliness. No human touch. To spend eternity with absolutely by yourself and not able to have any kind of interaction with anybody. Because you can't see nowhere in scripture. It talks about torture and all this, but it never says that you get a chance to hang out with anyone. Well, I guess they can, if, they, if you want to come to that point, it could be, I guess, misery loves company. That would be even, I don't know which one would be more miserable. We all suffering and screaming and hollering? <laughs> or are you just suffering and screaming and hollering by yourself? See, most do I understand the divine mercy of God. God is most merciful. Uh, the language that is used many times about hell is frightening. Now, most of the time, there's sometimes the Bible uses hell that's talking about Gehenna. I, we won't get all of that right now, but specifically it's talking about eternal damnation. Matthew 8 and 12 says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It speaks of outer darkness. Then it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Most may be weeping. I think the majority of people will be weeping. <clears throat> but some have suggested that the gnashing of the teeth are those who are still angry with God because he's punishing them and they're gnashing their teeth like, I dare you punish me. But it doesn't make any difference because it does not change the facts that they will be in eternal fire. They will be uh, in eternal pain. <clears throat> but the Lord has provided the proper garment for us to be invited to the wedding banquet. But most reject uh, the attire that the Lord has provided for us. You do know that, right? Here's your, your wedding outfit. Just imagine you go to a wedding, a big, say a big shindig, and everybody in there dressed with like black attire or whatever. You come in there with some all that dirty clothes on, saying, yeah, what's the party? I don't think you're going to be welcome in there, right? Attempting to get into heaven on your own righteousness is like wearing filthy, dirty clothes that you haven't bathed in 20 years, all in filth and everything else is on you, and you're trying to come to heaven. The Lord has provided the proper garment for you. If you want to come to the wedding banquet, you need to put on the proper garments. Now, if you look at Matthew chapter 22, it speaks of the parable of the wedding banquet. Verse 11 and 12 of Matthew 26 says, But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless, it says. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He didn't have the proper garments on. The clothing has been provided to all the guests. Colossians uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 10 says, But now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man, with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Those invited to the wedding banquet have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. They have disrobed their flesh, and they're saying, my new attire is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's what Romans was trying to get to. Romans chapter 13 verses 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What you say? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the righteousness of Jesus through faith. And don't worry about fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Galatians 3 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You need the proper garments if you're going to come to the wedding feast. You can't come in there with your own filthy rags. Your best work is filthy rags. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ or you on your way to hell. It's just as simple as that. We are to clothe ourselves with the righteousness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ that is the only thing that can save us from eternal damnation. I'm preaching now. I say if you want to be saved from eternal damnation, the scripture says put on him. Take off you, your self-worth, your self-ego. Uh, Jesus says if anyone wants to come after me, he first must deny himself. You got to take off you. You got to think, stop thinking you good. Once you get in your mind, you ain't good enough to get to heaven. You stop with all the pretense then. I don't care who likes it. You're not good enough to get to heaven. I'm not good enough to get to heaven. Paul's not good enough to get to heaven. Peter's not good enough to get to heaven. The Pope is not good enough to get to heaven. Mary's not good enough to get to heaven. We all have to come the same. Ain't but one way. There ain't two ways. There ain't being born a Jew and you automatically go to heaven. Paul made that clear. See, our problem is, is that we want to we wanna change the scriptures up because we want to make sure nobody getting offended. I don't care if you're offended. I'm trying to snatch you out of hell. You worrying about being offended, hurting somebody's feelings. Your feelings are going to be hurt more than that when you get in hell's fire. You think you got hurt feelings now? You ain't seen nothing yet. I said that e- hell is e- eternal torment. None stop. And you worry about hurting somebody's feelings. You better get over yourself because you're going to find, find yourself in hell trying to change the gospel around. It don't work like that. God is not concerned with your feelings. Get over your feelings. Your problem is you in your feelings too much. It ain't got nothing to do with your feelings. Y'all don't need to apologize when I'm speaking what thus says the Lord. People want to use the, oh my God, let me sugarcoat. I ain't sugarcoating it for you. Don't get mad at me. I mean, the, the, you, you mad at the wrong person. God Almighty is the one you need to be mad at, and he don't care if you get upset. Hell is a place where we will be estranged from all fellowship with the Lord. Some think that they want to have nothing to do with the God of Scripture while they're on earth. That's going to change real soon. But as long as you are on this earth, you, have, you, you are breathing his oxygen. If the Lord just took all his oxygen from you, you would not be living. You still, even the heathen is living by grace. The atheist is living by grace. God takes the oxygen from you. You would not live. It is absurd that somebody thinks that all of a sudden an explosion happened and just so happened that the earth has oxygen on it. Just so happened after the explosion that all of a sudden it's going to notice you need oxygen for these humans that has not even came into existence yet to come out the, the, the mud, I guess. It's absurd. The whole premise of atheism is completely absurd. You want me to believe that the earth exploded and that earth that exploded just happens to have oxygen on it. That earth that it exploded just happened to stop enough distance from the sun and the moon. It's absurd. The whole premise is absurdity. Atheism is absurd in and of itself. Nothing from nothing will not ever come up with something. It's absurdity. Pure foolishness and folly. And these atheists and these other people want to backpedal because some atheists are challenged. Well, I think the Bible contradicts itself. Well, show me how it all got here, you freaking moron, you. Are you kidding me? It's absurd. Think God cares anything about what these mere mortals are saying? Think they're intellects? You're not an intellect. The Bible calls you a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And you're going to wake up in hell if you don't repent. Hell is a place that you are estranged from, not only fellowship from the Lord, but fellowship from anyone. Some think that they want 
to have nothing to do with God. I, boy, I just almost, you almost want to feel sorry for them, the sheer stupidity. Hell is a place where mercy and grace have run out. Just think about that for a minute. People think they are doing others a favor when they call themselves being tolerant. We should all show some courtesy to others. But when someone wants you to denounce what the God of glory has declared in his word, we must vehemently reject that with every fiber of our being. No apology, no, no, no trying to shuffle around it. People call it arrogant when you say, I don't care what you think. That's what God says. You can get over it. See, if people have that John Baptist mentality, the Elijah mentality, the apostles like, they say, well, if you think that you're doing the right thing, hey, you have at it. But as for me, you're not going to get me to be going against the God of glory, the one who inhabits eternity. You must reject with every fiber of your being anybody telling you to call your God a liar. You should be offended. I don't know how more people don't get offended. Somebody call you a liar or call one of your families a liar, you get upset, and we have lied before. God Almighty has never told a lie. He changed it not, and they're calling your God a liar to his face. We don't believe the, 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 the Bible is the word of God. Uh, I found some contradiction. No, let's go back to the beginning then. Before we get to that, let's go back to the beginning. Now, I don't want to skip around. I don't let you skip around. I dictate the argument. And the argument, we need to go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis. Show me how it all got here before we start talking about knowing all this stuff. It's absurd. Your whole theory is absurd. You want to pick and choose because you cannot defend your argument. Hell is a real place. And there's going to be a lot of people in hell, too. And it's a place that nobody would want their loved ones really to go to. You got to have a vehement hate when you think about what hell is to actually want somebody to go to hell. When you think about what hell really is. We tell people carefree, go to hell. We don't really understand what hell is. If you really love someone, the worst thing you can do is lie to them so that they will end up in hell. You don't, you don't love them. You hate them. When a preacher... Or a Christian says they don't want to judge others because they want to be tolerant. It is an act of complete hatred for those that claim, claim to love. It is complete hatred. You say, I love you so much, I want to send you to hell. That's technically what you're saying. I want you to go to hell because I, I really love you so much. Because lying to them, trying to sugarcoat the word of God, you're making them comfortable for hell, but they're not going to be comfortable once they get there. And you're going to be held accountable too for trying to make people comfortable for hell. I'm sick of these wishy-washy Christians. Just, just so, just so flippant about worrying about my family said this, my, my cousin said this, my preacher said my preacher, my bishop said this. I don't care what they said. I don't care. This is what the word of God says. I don't care how many followers you got. I don't care who loves it. Paul says, if anybody preaches another gospel, let them be accursed. Let them be damned to hell. I don't want to hear this sugarcoat stuff. If you love someone, you had information that their home was going to be set on fire. Just a, let me set it up for you. I love you a whole lot, and I know for a fact that your house is going to be set on fire. On top of that, all the doors and windows are going to be sealed so to make sure you're trapped inside. And I'm going to do that, but I know it's going to happen. I love you, but I want to tell you because I want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to get you worked up. But somebody's going to set your house on fire, and they're going to bolt you inside so you can get burned alive. In other words, they will be burnt alive, and you know about this, but you say, I love that person, but I don't want to tell them because I want to hurt their feelings. Is that love? That is complete hatred, if you ask me. This sugary gospel that everybody keeps talking about, Trying to make sure they go alone. There's a lot of people that's getting their family sent to hell. Matter of fact, they're going to go to hell because of their family or their friends or some kind of big bishop that they thought was, I don't care who says it. We got to stop this. People are going to hell and you're worrying about hurt feelings. You are, that's demonic if you ask me. The very notion of letting somebody go to hell because you want to hurt their feelings is demonic. It's the most hateful thing you could possibly do. Do you hate that person so much you're trying to send them to hell? Do you understand what hell is? I would rather let you get burned alive than have your feelings hurt. See, this sounds insane, but people 
They do this day in and day out, claiming they love people while lying to them so that they will never accept the mercy of God. I want to literally scare the hell out of you. Hell is real, and the eternal punishment should scare the hell out of us. Just think about hell. The next time you think about, you think you just want to just keep doing whatever you want to do, whatever your besetting sin. Think about hell. Like, do I want to spend eternity in hell? You said once saved, always saved. Well, if you really saved, why are you acting like that? You can never quench hell's fire by lying to people. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of God shall stand forever. How long is forever? Forever, ever. The word of God is settled in eternity. Mark 9 and 43 says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to having two hands to go to hell and to a fire that will shall never be quenched. My God, Lord Jesus, that is strong language. This ain't the Jesus I know. So this does not mean go cut your hand off. This means stop sinning. It's best to maim yourself than to keep sinning. Now, maiming yourself doesn't stop your sins because it's eternal. It just says it's talking about the, the extent, the extreme you should go to to stop living in filth. That's what he's saying. It means whatever's keeping you from walking with the Lord Jesus should be done away with and all excuses should be stopped. Well, you know, I just really love the Lord Jesus, but you know, I'm just having struggles and stuff. Okay, let me see what let me let me see what you actually do all day. Let me see what you look at all day. Let me see who you talk to all day. Let me see what you listen to all day. You're feeding yourself filth day in and day out, and you wonder why you're struggling. Uh, you don't love the Lord Jesus enough to stop it. Matter of fact, you're not scared enough of hell to stop what you're doing because it's so comfortable. It feels so good. And if something feels so good, it's got to be right. If a preacher or a priest tells you that there is no such thing as hell, you should say that your services are no longer needed. Why do I need you if there is no hell? <laughs> Why have a preacher? Why have a priest? If you say there's no hell, I don't need your services because if there is no hell, why should I fear eternity or dying? And if there is a hell, this preacher or this preach is attempting to lead me into eternal hell. Anyway, I don't need you. Soon as you hear a preacher or anybody says there is no hell, don't listen to them anymore. Because there ain't but two things they can be doing. If there's really not no hell, what difference does it make what I do? What difference does it make if I don't live for the Lord? I'm not going to hell anyway. You just said there's no such thing as hell. Why should I fear death? Are you kidding me? No, I don't fear death. And if there is a such thing as hell, you're trying to get me sent to hell by telling me there is no hell. So either way, your service is no longer needed. Listen to what the Lord Jesus continues to say in Mark chapter 9. He says, Were there worm diet not? And the fire is not quenched. It keeps saying the fire is not quenched. <clears throat> you know, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar. You don't have to speak Greek to understand when it keeps saying where the fire quenches not. The worm diet not. You don't have to be a scholar to figure out what it's talking about. Then it says, if thy foot, he goes on just in case you didn't get it. The Lord Jesus, go, this is Jesus talking now. Very unloving. It's not the Jesus I know. In, 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 uh, in uh, Mark chapter 9, in verse 45, it says, If thy foot, now he already said chop the hand off. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell. What difference does it make if it's no such thing as hell? How am I going to get cast into some if it's not a such thing as that? That don't make any sense, Jesus. Unto the fire that never shall be quenched. Then verse 46 says, where thy worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. But he wasn't finished. He goes on to say, in case you didn't get it, verse 47 of Mark chapter 9 says, and if thy eye offend thee, wait a minute, Lord Jesus, I didn't cut my hand off and my foot. I'm hopping around here, I got one hand. He said, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. That was a guy in prison. I forgot where it was. I did a story on it. 
And this guy literally pulled his own eye sockets out because the demons was tormenting him. And he thought, I guess, if he pulled his eyes out, he won't be tormented anymore. It didn't work for him. He had no eyes. He blinded himself and he still was being tormented. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. This Jesus is extreme. This is hard teaching Jesus. I don't know if I like this Jesus here. I want the Jesus just talk about love. Then he says, where thou worm diet not, and the fire is not quenched. He keeps repeating this phrase over and over in Mark chapter 9. But he wasn't finished. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but it's the salt have lost its salt and its wherein will ye season it. Have salt in yourself and have peace one with another. When the master uses the phrase over and over where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, this is taken from Isaiah 66 and 24. It is said that the word translated hell in many places is Gehenna. It is a, it is a Hebrew phrase to the, the valley of, Ahen, of Hena. There's where an actual valley outside of Jerusalem is said in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 that King Ahaz sacrificed his own children to the fire god called Molik. But the picture of hell is one of everlasting punishment. Now, I think we should contemplate hell more, so maybe it will scare the sin out of us. Old time preachers used to preach about a little fire and brimstone all the time. I'm not saying you got to do fire and brimstone all the time, but I think we have gotten so far away from it that if you even mention hell, if you even mention eternal punishment, somebody's, oh, I was offended by this service. I don't think I'm going to be going back to the church of that pastor because he talked about hell. For God I knew would never punish people to hell. You don't know God. You need to repent. See, the Holy Spirit works in us to cleanse the sin out of us. It is called the sanctification process. We are being sanctified daily by washing ourselves in his word and asking the Holy Spirit to cleanse us. See, once you understand that the Holy Spirit dwells in you, once you understand who God is, you'll stop being concerned about what everybody else thinks. The only reason we're so concerned about what everybody else thinks is because we don't know the true God or we not have, have not fully comprehend who he is. Because then you'll start worrying about what other people say. Such and such said, said this right here. Why would I care? Why do I care what such and such? Is, does such and such know about eternity? Has such and such been here from everlasting to everlasting? Such and such is going to die and go to hell unless that such and such repents. So I'm not concerned with what such and such say about any subject. Okay, how smart they think they is. We'll stop being impressed with other people once we understand who the true God is. Once you know who Jehovah is, you'll stop being impressed with people like, can you do this? Can you tell me all of this? Can you create something out of nothing? Can you, can you uh, tell me all things would, would never get anything confused and you don't have to write it down? Do you have the kind of power that can create something out of nothing? I'm just saying, it's going to be hard to impress me once I know who God is. <laughs> I just don't understand people get so impressed with people. This is mere humans here. We're talking about a God that does all things well. We're talking about a God who comes down and he creates these complex things like the human body out of nothing. He takes dirt and makes all these complex arguments. I don't know how he does it. It'll blow your mind. See, that's why they want to they say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, what you're talking about don't make any sense because... Saying that a, a, a God who has the power to exist within and of himself is a little bit different by saying that nothing created something. That's absurd. There is nothing that exists that doesn't have a creator. It's absurdity. The whole philosophy of this whole Darwin's theory, the whole philosophy of things evolving and coming into complex beings on itself is absurdity in and of itself. Seems like we go to school to uneducate ourselves. It's sheer stupidity. When we think about hell, it should make us want to cleanse our hearts and minds daily. It should force us to want to snatch others out of eternal punishment. There is no relief once you die. After death, there is a judgment. That's what the Bible teaches. We should fear 
a God that can cast you into hell's fire. No human can put you in the hell. When the Lord Jesus spoke about hell in Luke chapter 12, he mentions teachings of the Pharisees, which he calls leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. See, hypocrisy means you're pretending to be something that you're not. Jesus says, beware of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. They're actors. They're putting, oh, I love Jesus. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. If you love the Lord, how are you going to not love his teachings then? Why are you siding with evil people if you love the Lord so much? Listen to what he says. He says, it says, in the meantime, when there were gathered together, innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another. This is Jesus talking to them. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaving of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither he that shall not be unknown, but I'm sorry, should be known. Therefore, Whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets, whispering in the dark, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more power than they can do. But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he had killed, had power to cast into hell. Yah say unto you, fear him. The master says, killing the body really is not going to do much when it comes to eternity. Because you're going to heaven, you just gave me my one-way ticket to heaven. But your, your eternity will not be good for you. We should fear the only one that can throw you into hell. We should not fear mere mortals who at worst can kill the body. Everything that we do in this life will be judged. And if we have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in for a very rude awakening. When we look at our text, you thought I wasn't going to get to it though, but I'm going to get to it. When we look at our text, uh, the rich man woke up in hell. Did you get that story? That's a bad thing right there to wake up in hell, boy. You're like, I thought I was dreaming. I'm in hell. Oh, this is real. He did not go to hell because he was rich. He ain't in hell because he was rich. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. He went to hell because he trusted in his riches and he ignored the poor man whom he could have helped. When you have an opportunity to help someone and you don't help them, uh, that's that can be detrimental because it's possible that the Lord is sending this person to see if you will actually show his love through you. Mm. See, this is a parable, so we cannot attempt to make this particular parable. Don't try to make it walk on all fours, as the old preachers would say. However, the message is clear in the story. Hell is real, and there is an eternal suffering. In the text, there are two people mentioned. The rich man, who some call Davies. I don't know if you ever heard that, but but the Latin phrase for rich man is Davies. So a lot of people say, when you hear somebody says Davies and Lazarus, they're just saying, they ain't, Davies is not really his name. But in the Latin, Davies literally means rich man. So we call him Davies. We do not know his real name, but uh, the name of the poor man it's, it's, he called by his name. Isn't that funny that the rich man don't really have a name, um, but the poor man is named Lazarus. He's called Lazarus. Now, I don't think this ain't the same Lazarus in John chapter 11. This is a parable. But our text gives Lazarus name. Uh, it reminds me of John chapter 10. It says, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Lazarus was a man of suffering because it was, it says that he was a beggar that was full of souls. And it also states that he was laid out at Dives' gate. So this means that this rich man, who we call Dives, could see Lazarus out there 
And here he is wanting some crumbs off the table, and the rich man won't even hook him up. You think he don't see Lazarus? Lazarus, you're going to see in a few minutes. We know he saw Lazarus. Matter of fact, he knows Lazarus by name. But he wouldn't feed it. The rich man lived a life of supreme luxury. You ever seen the lifestyle of the rich and famous? They got waiters and butlers and stuff. Ooh, they got the fanciest things, all the finest food. Uh, They living in the lap of luxury. It says he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. Mm, mm, mm. See, notice that when we talk about uh, eternal fire and, and damnation, they suffer day in and day out. It says while this fellow was on earth, Mr. Davies, Mr. Davies was living the good life. Every day he fared sumptuously. I mean, he fared with the best of the best. This was the lifestyle of the rich and famous. Now, on the other hand, Lazarus got more love from the dogs than he got from Davies. Now, dogs in this day, most of the time was, was not considered as man's best friend. Some think that these could have been wild dogs that ran the streets. It is, however, possible that these were maybe some pet wild dogs to the rich man that came and licked Lazarus' sores out of love because dogs like to lick on you. If you got a pet dog, you know they got to come on and lick on you. They like to lick on you. That's how they show love. It's possible that the animals just saw this sores on Lazarus and they thought it was food, or it's possible that they were showing some type of love towards Lazarus, which Davies never showed. The dog showed Lazarus more love than the rich man, Davies. The dogs would lick the sores of Lazarus, which may seem very, very unsanitary when you think about it. You will notice that the story says they both died. And we know that after death is the judgment, right? You will notice that Lazarus was taken first. Did you get that in the text? Lazarus died first. Many have said that the righteous is most often taken first to give the sinner time to repent. We can speculate and say that's true in some cases. This is not always the case because if there, if there were all of the good saints died off early, the earth would really be a bad place to live then. There are some saints who lived a long time. Death is something that happens to the rich and to the poor, to the good and the bad, to the ungodly and the godly. However, death is not bad for those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We who are in Christ Jesus do not need to fear death. Lazarus dies and he is being comforted now. The text says the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Did you know the difference there? Lazarus got an angel escort into heaven or into Abraham's bosom, but it simply says the rich man was buried. Mm. You will notice that while Lazarus died, First, it peeps into hell with the rich man first. Mm. It says, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. That's hell. This is a parable, but there's a real hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Why talk about somebody being in torment if you annihilate it? 
He lifted up his eyes. See, that, the, the, the parable don't make no sense if there's no such thing as hell. What kind of ridiculous parable is Jesus to tell this if there's no such thing as hell? It says, in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see it Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. If you notice in the story, it does not say that the rich man was hanging out with his friends in hell. It don't say that. It didn't say, we're partying down here. How's it going up there, Lazarus? No, no, it don't say nothing about nobody else was with him. <clears throat> I don't believe those in hell will be able to see what's going on in heaven or in Abraham's bosom. This is a parable. Like I told you, you can't make it walk on all fours, but it has a lot of truth in the parable. However, this parable is describing the pain of hell. It seems it would be more painful to be in hell and you saw it in heaven. Because that, to me, makes it even worse. <laughs> you down here suffering, talking about, I need water. And they're up here having a ball up in heaven, drinking fine wine, uh, talking to the apostles, uh, speaking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you down here suffering. I think that would be even worse. You, you are suffering for all eternity and to see those living in a life you thought you had on earth. Remember it says while he was on earth that he was clothed in purple, fine linen. He fared sumptuously every day. Now the poor man or Lazarus is clothed in purple and fine linen. See, on earth, the rich man had it going on. Um, but in heaven, uh, Brother Lazarus is uh, living and faring sumptuously for all eternity. Mm -mm. Now, I don't know how old either fellow was, but just let's give him like an old age. Let's just say the rich man was 90, and let's say Lazarus was 85. So that's one live 90, one 85, but what does that compare to eternity? What comes next should be appalling so those who he, who uh, 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 hears Dive, Divey's request, his request is appalling to me. What the rich man known as Divey's, which we call him, his request should be appalling to you. He says, watch this, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. In other words, let Lazarus be my, my, my water boy now. Let him be my servant now. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in this flames. Wait one minute, fella. You want this same Lazarus, whom you would not even give crumbs off your table. Now you want him to come dip his finger in water and touch it on your tongue. Is that what you're asking me, Mr. Davies? Are you Are you serious? The audacity of you. Here you are, Got all this food just living the best life. Lazarus out here got dogs licking on his sores and you won't even feed the man. And now you in hell. And you want uh, Abraham to send Lazarus to hook you up. What is more important about the story is that he now sees that hell is real. I want to make that clear. There will come a day when all those who die will come to the same conclusion. Either you're going to die and be brought back to eternal life or you're going to die and have torment forever. How long is forever? Forever is forever. Davi's fate will be the fate of all those who reject the Lord Jesus Christ. I say is the fate that Davi's encountered waking up in hell is the fate that all who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will be. You say, that sounds narrow-minded. Get over it. Do you want to go to hell or you don't want to go to hell? I'm trying to hook you up. Because trying to sugarcoat it, pretending like Islam can get you to heaven, is absurdity. Pretending as if the Jehovah Witness, who don't even believe in hell, can get you into heaven is laughable. To pretend as if the Mormons who think that Jesus is just another God can get you into heaven is absurdity in and of itself. The Buddhists or anybody else you want to name cannot get you into heaven. You say that sounds narrow-minded. Do you want to go to heaven or you don't want to go to heaven? Because one day you're going to find out and wake up like Davies 
and you're going to be wanting me to come down and dip my finger in that water and put it on your tongue, but it's not going to be happening. Davi's faith is going to be the same faith, or our faith, those who don't believe in the Lord Jesus, will be the same faith that suffered, that Davi suffered. All who die without the Lord Jesus Christ will one day beg for relief, but there will be no relief. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you accept the Lord Jesus Christ? Because once you pass over to the other side, it will be too late. Don't let nobody fool you that is a purgatory. Don't you believe that lie? Mm -mm. Can't find no purgatory nowhere in Scripture. This is his purgatory right here. Hell is his purgatory. <laughs> That's his purgatory right there. The Lord Jesus came that we might have eternal life. We can choose to follow our beliefs or we can accept the teachings of Scripture. It is too late uh, for Brother Davies because he has stepped off into eternity now. Now, Abraham reminds uh, Brother Davies of something. He says, son, do you remember? Oh, you ain't going to go that, do you, Abraham? Abraham says, you remember that time. That's what I think Abraham is trying to say. Son, you remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise uh, Lazarus uh, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art torment. That is so unloving, Abraham. You don't have no mercy on him. You can't give him a little relief. Just let him have one drink of water at least every thousand years, Abraham. Abraham is saying that the roads have been switched. You had it going on while you was on earth. Now, Brother Lazarus has it going on now. It should also be noted that the rich man knew who Lazarus was. Did I tell you he knew who he was? While he was at your gate begging and stuff, you didn't know him. Did you ever call his name? Said Lazarus, come on in and have some food with me. Now, now, he passed by like, look at this beg out here. Send the dogs out there to lick on his sores. Yeah, I got plenty of food right here. Got plenty of wine. Invite some more family over. Got plenty enough. I don't know how people can see people just suffering all the time and never even be moved to ever help anyone. It should also be noted that the rich man, I just can't get, get over that, that he knew who he was. He did not bother to give Lazarus food or to comfort him while he was on earth. But now he wants Lazarus to show him some mercy. Well, there will be no mercy shown after death. Why didn't he address Lazarus instead of Abraham? Come to think about it. Why didn't he say, hey, Lazarus, you remember me? He don't even address Lazarus. He addresses Abraham and says, could you speak to Lazarus and send him my way? Because I'm a big shot on earth. I was a big shot on earth, but he ain't a big shot now. I bet he may have been on a, a one. I mean, I, I think he may have been one of those who had uh, all of these, quote, fun things while on earth. We did a lot of fun things. We just, we was partying like it's 1999. Because we have many today that think it's funny making fun of the things of God. Oh, that's real funny. These Christians are crazy. They think of Jesus coming back. Don't worry. Don't worry. Keep your laughing here. <laughs> See, I bet Davies probably told some couple good jokes too. I bet he wouldn't tell them jokes after he died though. They too will suffer the same eternal punishment that Davies is suffering. Those who's mocking God right now, make no mistake about it, hell is real. When the Pharisees came out to hear John the Baptist, you remember that story over there? They came out, and just this fella John, boy, that's why he's cousin of Jesus. This fella right here, wasn't he wasn't having none of it. This is what John says, very unloving of John too. He says, the ax is already at the root of the trees. Wait a minute, John, they want to hear you preach. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. These boys have a fascination with this fire. Now that's a fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the burn and burning up the chaff, which is unquenchable fire. What you say? You got to be kidding me. 
I mean, you got to be freaking and kidding me. What you say? Divies had become few for the fire. That's what everybody who goes to hell become few for the fire because he did not produce good fruit. He was vain in his thinking and living. He was self-centered and selfish, just like trees that produce no fruit are good for nothing but being few for the fire. Also, people who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ uh, are like rotten or no fruit bearing trees. We who believe uh, are God's wheat and we are gathered into his bones. But the chaff or the unbeliever is placed in the unquenchable fire. I don't know how that is, unquenchable fire. In other words, it never ceases from burning. Unquenchable fire. Unquenchable means the fire never goes out. Davies in our story is looking for relief while in the unquenchable fire. I don't want to feel that pain. I don't know about you, but that scares the hell out of me. Unquenchable fire. I can't even comprehend what that means. It never stops. But then Abraham says in our story, and besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. This should dispel all of this talk about dead spirits and visiting people. The devil may be playing tricks on your mind, and if the Lord wanted, he could call up someone like he did with Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. But this talking to dead people is dangerous. This talking, you better, do you, do you remember Saul? When he went over to the witch and she said, she got scared when, when all of a sudden Samuel came up. She got scared because it's all a fake and a ruse talking to dead people. I ain't scared of no dead people. I'm not scared of graveyards. Because a graveyard, I can sleep easily in a graveyard. It's a little creepy, but it's dead people there. Dead people ain't bothering me. No, you ain't got to worry about the dead people because they dead, boss. But to think that once you have been locked in your eternal prison, you will not escape. Once you have been locked in your eternal prison, because hell is an eternal prison. Hell is the ultimate solitary confinement. It is said that solitary confinement can lead to serious psychological damage to people. Just leave people in a solitary confinement for, for, for months. It just drives them crazy. Imagine being in a solitary confinement for eternity while you're suffering. They say what's worst about solitary confinement is the physical and social isolation. The idleness of having nothing to occupy your time drives people crazy. An uh, idle mind, they say, is the devil's workshop. But I tell you, in, in hell, uh, there's going to be a lot of idle time that you can reflect. And you're going to just be tormented. You ain't show me anywhere in scripture where it says anybody in hell is having a point. I know when they see these pictures, they see all these people in the same holding tank. I don't get that. I, I won't be emphatic on it, but I have not found anywhere in Scripture where it says that you get a chance to see anybody. This is like the worst of all worst solitary confinements hell is. Many human rights groups condemn use, the use of so solitary confinement because they say it's just, it's just too much for the human mind. Because they say leaving people in solitary confinement for five and six months drives people crazy. Hell is solitary confinement on steroids multiplied by a trillion. Mm. I say hell is solitary confinement on steroids multiplied by a trillion, whatever that number is. I don't know what it is, but I don't want to find out either. Because all my good, all the good things we're going to see, those who follow in Jesus, are going to be multiplied by a trillion. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the good things he got in store for us. It's going to be party like it's 1999 now. Not only is there complete darkness in hell, but there's also pain and suffering and isolation. <laughs> My God. 
So that's why it was created for 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 the devil and his in his his demons. But a lot of people are going because they followed the demon himself. Just like he dragged a, a third of the angels out of heaven, he's gonna drag more than a third of the humans down the hill with him. They follow. You go look at the TV. Go look at your politicians. All you see is people who are worshiping the devil. See, when I say that these people are demonic, I'm not just saying that in like some just just to get a point across. I mean, I'm literally saying they worship the devil. I'm literally saying that, that they are on their way to hell because they worship the devil. Because when you worship the devil, you go to hell unless you repent. I haven't seen much repentance out of your so-called leaders, have you? Everything you fear and dread will is what hell would be. Everything you fear and dread times a trillion in solitary confinement is what you're going to get in hell. Your mind can't wrap around that kind of punishment. You just can't. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go to hell. Mm -mm, uh -uh. I don't think you will ever see anyone else in hell. I just don't believe it. You get your own holding room of torment. All your fears probably is going to be magnified then. Whatever you really fear, it just gets magnified. Plus, I don't know if you really can see anything, even though the fire never is quenched. I don't know if the kind of fire that's in darkness. I don't know how it works, but I know I don't want to go there. You will notice that to, to the rich man never thought about winning souls while he was on earth. But now he's going to turn into a missionary person. This, is, this dive is his something else. First, he's asking Lazarus to come hook him up. He didn't ever feed the man while he was having all this great feast and stuff. Now he wants to turn into a missionary. He says to Abraham, watch this. I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now he's ordering that Lazarus around to go over to preach to, 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 to his brother in there. He didn't turn from, I want some quenching because I'm thirsty down here. I'm really hot. It's really, I'm, I'm being tormented down here. But since you won't send me no water, I want to turn into a missionary person. I'm going to do good now. I'm going to do the right thing now. I'm going to mind, Lord. I'm going to do the right thing. Would you just please, 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 uh, uh, would you, I pray thee, thou father Abraham, would you please send uh, Brother Lazarus over to my father's house because I got five brethren that, that he may testify unto them lest they also should come to this place of torment. Boy, that Davies, I'm telling you, he's a piece of work. Let me, let me see if I got you right here. So uh, did you need your brothers feed Lazarus too? Because I'm sure they saw Lazarus too when they was coming over your house. Now you want the hookup from Lazarus. First you want him to be your errand boy. You want him to be your waiter. Bring you some water. Now you're telling him, send Lazarus over as a missionary worker because I'm a missionary person now and I want to send him out as a missionary uh, work to my father's house because I got five brothers and they headed this way too. They headed down here. Could you send Lazarus over to take care of that? Think about what he's asking for. He's asking for Lazarus to be sent to him for relief at first. And since the request was denied, he's now uh, has uh, a, he's asking for a, I guess he's asking for some type of a hell furlough or something like that, which can be compared to a prison furlough. He may have been sincere about wanting to stop his brothers from coming to hell. I don't believe he really was, but maybe he just said he's sincere. Or it could be he would help himself get out. In other words, send me. I'll, I'll hook my brothers up if you just send me right now. Then I can fix myself a drink of water. Uh, if you let me get, go over and talk to my brother, because I'm a missionary worker now while I'm in hell. I want to turn into a missionary worker now. It's very possible that he's not really thinking about his brothers. He's simply wanting relief for himself. Now, see, I'm a good person. See how good I am. I'm worried about my brothers. I'm worried about my brethren now. He has gone from the rich, selfish fool to the Apostle Paul wanting to save his brethren then. Ooh, it reminds me of Romans chapter 10. You remember Paul? This is this is Dives trying to be the Apostle Paul, and he's going to quote Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, for my brethren, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant, of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness 
have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speak it on this wise. Say not to thy in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? This is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart. And the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, this is Divis preaching now, he's taking on the, the role of Apostle Paul. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Divis said, I believe that now, send me back. Send Lazarus over there, son. And when Lazarus go over there, tell me to bring me a drink of water too. <laughs> Why are you in there, Lazarus? Just go ahead and bring me a drink of water while you over there talking to my brothers. What Abraham is saying is that, because you, you see what Abraham says next. Abraham says to Dives, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He just cut off all community. Wait, wait a minute. They got Moses and the prophets. In other words, they got the word of God. Abraham is saying, that your brothers are without excuse. Abraham is saying God has given his word to all. If your brothers brothers choose to reject that, then I can't help them. What Abraham was saying is that the scriptures testify on the wrath that is coming because it's a coming. The wrath of God is being poured out. Abraham says the wrath is on its way. Read the scriptures and and the scriptures will show you that the wrath of God is a coming. Now, John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus Christ both warn uh, the so-called leaders of their days about hells of fire. Over in John, I'm sorry, uh, 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 I think John the Baptist says over in Matthew chapter 3, this is John talking to these uh, holy rollers who came out. These are the church folk. Ooh, they really, really holy. Looks real holy. Got a big Bible, too. Ooh, you got it all marked up, too. Ooh, I'm impressed. Uh, do you live that Bible, or do you just mark it up and pretend everybody tell me how holy you are? Ooh, such and such, deacon such and such is so holy. Uh, sister such and such is so holy. If anybody allows people to just constantly tell me how holy they are, I'm just going to start questioning that. Because we're all filthy rags, but the righteousness of Jesus. See, it's best to let somebody else brag on you than you're bragging on yourself. Yes, I'm a holy. Matthew chapter 3. This is John the Baptist talking. Watch this. This John the Baptist is so unloving. He said, O generations of vipers. My God, calling them snakes. Who had warned ye to flee from the wrath to come? There it is. Whoop, there it is. John says the wrath is a coming. But I want to know, you generations of vipers, that sounds really unloving. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Watch this, though. He wasn't finished. John the baptizer says, bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. Mmm. Got to have some repentance going on right here. Come on now, John. You're going to make them feel bad about themselves talking about this whole repentance. See, repentance means you're a sinner. Repentance means that you're filthy and you need to take a Holy Ghost bath. That's what it means. He said that sounds very, very unloving. I don't think John the Baptist really cares. He goes on to say, and think not to say within yourselves. He's about he's going to cut the legs from under him right now. We are have Abraham to our father. Father Abraham has many sons. And then he says, For I say unto you that God is able to of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He can do it. Oh, yes, God can. In other words, God's wrath is coming against all who have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. John then says, I don't care about your pedigree of being descendants of Abraham. Woo! That boy John is a preacher. Now he says, I don't care nothing about your pedigree. I don't care who your mom and your daddy is. I don't care who your kinfolk is. He said, I don't care about none of that. I don't care about you being descendants of Abraham. It's kind of funny in our text that Dives is speaking to Abraham. Maybe he was a descendant of Abraham 
and that uh, he also thought he had a get out of hell free card. Maybe Davies was saying, I'm okay now because I am a, a descendant of the Abraham. Yes, I am. And I have my get out of hell free card right here. Right here is all in yellow. I have an orange one too, just like the Monopoly game. I have my get out of hell free card. John, that uh, the, 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 John says the Lord of glory can make children out of stones. Wait a minute, John. Are you telling me that being born Jewish don't automatically get you into heaven? Because there's some very, very popular preachers on the internet who goes with this same uh, point right here. They're adamant about it too. Wait a minute, but it says, this is John talking. He says that if the Lord wants to, he can take these stones and make himself humans out of stones if he wanted to. Because if you if you want to argue this point, technically he made humans out of dirt in the first place. When the Lord Jesus was giving his woes unto the Pharisees, he tells them that their final resting place would be hell because of their rejection of him, which is the truth. He is the truth. I am the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father by me. The Lord Jesus was having a conversation over in Matthew chapter 23. Very, very unloving conversation he was having. And it's called the, the, the woes that Jesus gives to these holy rollers. Matthew 20, uh, 23, starting at verse 13 says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourself, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go into it. Isn't that something? He says, you're not going to heaven. And you want to prevent everybody else from going to heaven. That's what a lot of these preachers are doing today. They're not going to heaven and they're trying their best to get you sit to hell with them. Then Jesus says, watch Jesus here. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses. Mm. And for a pretense, make long prayer. Pretense with these long prayers. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Wow. He says, you're going to get it. There's different punishments in hell. I don't know if you knew this or not. But there's different punishments for those who go. Everybody don't get the same punishment. No, no, no. No, no, no. Just like it's different rewards for those who go in hell. There's different degrees of punishment. Just say like somebody like Adolf Hitler is not going to get the same punishment as somebody who's not going around killing. But without Jesus, you're still going to hell. It's still going to be gnashing of teeth and weeping and all of that. But Jesus says that this pretense of these long prayers, they're trying to impress somebody else because they're not impressing God. But the master wasn't finished because he went with another woe. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He keeps calling them hypocrites. For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than you yourself. That is very unloving, Jesus. Why would Jesus use that kind of language? Oh, you're going to hurt somebody's feelings here, Lord Jesus. He says that these Pharisees, they go across land and sea just to get one conversion. Look at this convert I got. He says, you're making them fit for hell. Wait a minute, Jesus. They go to church. They give money to the church. They even volunteer sometimes, Jesus. But they don't know him. No make no difference all this other stuff you're doing. If you don't know him, it ain't going to do you no good. Because the master says, you make him even a worse, I think he called it a twofold, more of the child of hell than you yourself. You going to hell, but you even make them worse than you. Then the master says, woe unto you, ye blind guys, which say whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing but whosoever should swear by the gold of the temple. He is a debtor, ye fools and blind. For whatsoever is greater, the gold or the temple that is sanctified, the gold. And whosoever should swear by the altar, it's nothing. But whosoever should swear by the gift that is upon the, is guilty, ye fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctified the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, swear by it. 
and by all things thereon. And whosoever shall swear by the temple, swear it by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, swear it by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For ye pay tithe in mint and in coming, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Those ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Now, if anybody wants to talk about tithes in the New Testament, that is right there. The Lord Jesus says judgment and mercy is better and more important, but he says you still should have been able to give too. Listen what he says. He said you gave, you paid a, 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 a your tithe. You gave all your tithes up. You paid a tenth on everything you got. He said you, that was good. You should have done that. But the, the more weightier matters Law and judgment and mercy and faith. He said, you should have done that first, but not left the other undone. You blind guys would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. My God, he's preaching. He said, thou, thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup. In other words, cleanse your heart. And the outside then will be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For ye are like unto the whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside. You ever look at those beautiful tombs? Look so pretty on the outside. But inside, the master said, is full of dead men's bones. Even so, ye are also outwardly appear righteous. He said, you look good from the outside, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Oh, people are so good at pretending. Why put on a big act to pretend they're good? It ain't even worth it. You might as well just do the right thing. Why pretend to be righteous? Why pretend to love Jesus? How about just love Jesus for real? How about just live for Jesus for real instead of pretending? Because we got some dynamic actors out there. Ooh, they're that they, they should get an award for acting. You receive the Oscar. Then Jesus says, Even so also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and, and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and you clean them up. The sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers of them of the blood of the prophets. Notice these hypocrites. They saying if they had been back there with the prophets, which they said they're descendants of, we wouldn't have killed the prophets. You're admitting that you're descendants of them, right? We wouldn't have killed the prophets. Then Jesus says, Wherefore you are witness unto yourself that ye are the children of them which killeth the prophets. But they're going to do the same thing to Jesus. These people are such hypocrites. They're saying we wouldn't have did it, but we're finna kill Jesus now. He says, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents. He calls them vipers and snakes too. Ye generations of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Jesus said, you're not going to be able to escape it. You fellas are just adding fuel to the fire when you get into hell. And your judgment is going to be worse than some of the other ones. I think Davies was so used to having what he wanted while on earth, he thought he could make requests while in hell. There ain't no request in hell. You don't get no special accommodations in hell. Well, I like to write. I like to send out uh, a request. I have a, a certain request. I need a little water. I need Lazarus down here to dip his, his finger in the water and bring me a drink. I'm thirsty. And also, while he's at that, send him over to my daughter's house and make sure he tells my five brethren, you don't want to come here. But doesn't it seem funny that he's saying this? See, saying that you're making all these requests when you didn't show any mercy while you was on earth, as the country folk would say, that dog don't hunt. No, no, that dog don't hunt here. Hell is a place where there is no relief throughout eternity. I don't think our minds can fully comprehend what hell will be like. Some people want to say that Everlasting in the scripture can be a temporary duration. If you use the argument to prove 
annihilation happens to the wicked, well, you may as well use that same argument to say that we don't really have eternal life. It's just for a short term. Well, how long is eternal life that we get? Oh, so eternal life means eternal. I mean, eternal punishment doesn't really mean eternal punishment, but eternal life means eternal life. Oh, that's that's real consistent. That means eternal or everlasting life will never happen for the saints. If eternal punishment is not happening for the wicked, eternal life cannot happen for us. So when Jesus says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, he was just talking about temporary. He didn't mean eternal, eternal. No, 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 no. No, he just meant kind of eternal. And when he talks about uh, uh, eternal punishment, he don't really mean that because of love. the God I know would never do such a thing. It seems unfathomable that some will be punished for all eternity. I'm s- I-, I admit that that sounds very, 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 very uh, uh, bad. That's, that seems like something real bad. But why don't why are they rejecting Jesus then? If you don't if you don't want eternal damnation, choose you this day, right? Why are you trying to blame God for you saying you say you had a choice, right? I have a choice. I can make my choice. Okay, then you made your choice. You made your bed. Now lay in it. Don't start complaining. Don't be like Divies trying to trying to boss people around now. Uh-uh, don't work like that. Scripture says we are all without excuse who hear the gospel and reject it. Remember that God is just. And if they are being punished, that means they deserve it because God is not a man like us. God doesn't make mistakes. If they're being punished, punished, a just God is punishing them with good reason, right? You will notice that Mr. Missionary Dives then says Moses and the prophets are not good enough to wake up his brothers. He said, ain't good enough for me, Mr. Missionary working up. Because it says, nay, father, Abraham, but if one will go unto them from the dead, I know for a fact they'll repent then. In other words, they need a miracle. Then they will repent. Now, I do remember that there was another Lazarus that the Lord Jesus raised from the dead, and the so-called leaders wanted to kill him because people was believing because he was raised from the dead. I don't. I believe, I don't think that's going to help him, Brother Davies, if somebody's raised from the dead. Miracles do not save anyone. If you have learned nothing from scriptures, you would know that miracles save no one. Not only did the Lord himself perform many miracles, but the disciples also did miracles and the people still killed most of them. Show me how that works right there again. I mean, they literally was busting Stephen upside the head while he was just preaching the gospel. Paul got his head chopped off. Uh, Peter was crucified and set on fire. Many say he was set on fire and crucified. If they hear... Abraham says to old Davies, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. We see how many reject the Lord Jesus, even though he also raised from the dead. After this brutal beating, he raised from the dead. Why don't people say, you know, we just don't believe Jesus really rose from the dead. Well, there's a little scripture over in 1 Corinthians. It was wrote. I don't know, about 16, 60, 80 or something around that time. 60, 62, 80, I believe. You're familiar with it. I think we've talked about it on some Resurrection Sundays before. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that great declarations of the resurrection. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I declare unto you, first of all, that which I also receive how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures now and that he was buried. Mm -hmm. He's dead, he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. In other words, it was prophesied that he would raise uh, on that day and that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then by the 12. And after, after that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once. Wait a minute right here, Paul. Wait a minute. Let me, let me see if I got you right. I'm a little confused here. Are you telling me that when Jesus rose from the dead, over 500 witnesses saw him at the same time? That's not hallucination. Because people, 500 people all don't hallucinate on the same thing. That just doesn't ever happen. So you're telling me 
that over 500 witnesses witnessed the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Still, many did not believe. The heart is so wicked that it refuses to look at that which is eternal. Every prophecy, every promise that has been declared in Scripture either has come to pass or will come to pass. So many people today want to explain hell away because they don't want anybody to be punished like this. The atheist insists that the Bible contradicts itself because in the King James Version they say hell means many different things. But there is no mistaking that in Scripture it says that the Lord Jesus gave them eternal life, right? And if eternal life does not mean eternity, then why even serve God? And just like eternal life means forever, eternal unquenchable fire means eternity or forever also. Today you still have hope of eternal life. As long as you are breathing, you can repent and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. But you must repent. The Lord says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abided on him. I would advise you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ this day. Because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another day. We pray, Lord, for those who are under the sound of my voice, that they would repent of their sins and they will accept you as Lord and Savior. Cleanse their hearts and minds. Let them understand that there is no getting to heaven without the blood of Jesus. Uh, make them understand that heaven is, hell, heaven is a real place, but so is hell. And hell is a place that was prepared, that you prepared for the devil and his uh, demons. But many choose to go there anyway. We pray, Lord, that you touch those uh, who are listening, touch their hearts, that they may repent of their sin and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray this day a special blessing. We pray for Brother Eric. We pray that you give him courage, help him in his schooling. We pray that you give him the mindset to uh, uh, get more in your word and understand you so he would have peace in his heart and give him success in whatever field he decides to go into. We pray a special blessing for Sister Angela. We pray, Lord, that you give her victory in that situation she's going through. Strengthen her, preserve her mind, give her the wisdom, and give her peace. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and God keep you. Remember, hell is real. Don't let nobody, don't let nobody fool you that hell is not real. Hell is real. And there's going to be a lot of people going to hell because people have uh, uh, tried to sugarcoat it for them. <clears throat> I just don't understand why you would try to make somebody more comfortable for hell. Seems like to me, if you love somebody, you should try to make sure they don't go to hell. You should make sure, like, whatever you do, you need to accept Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ today. Because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Matter of fact, next week, some of us might not be here. As I speak to you right now, by this time next week, a bunch of people who's on this earth is going to step off into eternity. Some's going to be going to heaven and some's going to be going to hell. In seven days, there's going to be a lot of people who leave this earth. Matter of fact, some people leaving the earth tonight. There are some people who are going to leave this earth tonight. And it would behoove us to try to prepare our minds and heart for this. We don't have to worry about it, those who are believing Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, you have everything you need in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to be fearing anything. If you lack wisdom, ask him for wisdom. If you are going through a situation, because as long as you're on the earth, you're going to be going through a situation. But the good news is he's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. That don't mean every day is going to be rosy. Every day is going to be how you want it to be. 
But we always have a comforter who lives within us because Jesus does care for us. He really does. God bless you guys. Stay strong. Stay close to the Lord. And make sure that you do uh, a little reading. Spend a little time with Jesus. Spend a little time talking to Jesus. This song used to say, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. That's what we need to do. Have a little talk with Jesus. God bless you. Stay strong, my brothers and sisters out there. And God will always uh, take care of his own. Shit.